And the meeting is um, abolition, can we get rid of the police? And our wonderful speaker, Charles Ahmed, who is a long time SWP member from Glasgow, uh, is a retired teacher and is also an anti-racist activist. Um, so she's going to speak in 30 minutes or so. And then what we'll do is we'll have a little chat between yourselves, for like two or three minutes, get to know each other, break the ice, and then we'll come back with some more questions, and then we'll go back to Charlotte for a sum up. And um, that's, that's all, that's it. So Charlotte, take it away. Thanks. Thanks for coming here. We're up against some big competition at this meeting, you know. Uh, but uh, I think the universe is telling us something. I mean, I have these little PowerPoint pictures, which we can't advance except manually. So how helpfully the Guardian today has got pictures of protests that it's going to be and the images are stark because every time you have a protest who turns up the police right look at that contrast of the protest with that police that's chilly and another picture here which i think is a brilliant one this is japan right striking workers who's on the other side right so these are the images that we get Every day, every year, police versus the rest of us. And this idea of abolition, maybe 10 years ago in this country, certainly in America, you talked about abolition and the police would probably get laughed out. Nobody would really take it seriously. What has changed? The movement has changed. Black Lives Matter has changed everything. 2014, uh, if you like, the, the birth of the modern Black Lives Matter movement with the death, the shooting of Michael Brown and the, the demonstrations that took place there, brought into sharp focus them versus us, the police versus protesters. And in this particular city, uh, the, the extent to which the police were like an army of occupation. They didn't look like our, you know, the normal image of police, you know. Now, one of the images I had there was, you know, the image they wanted to get across, nice, friendly people talking to you on your doorstep. This was like an army of occupation against peaceful protesters on the other side, protesting black people getting killed with impunity by a police force and nothing happening. And so the idea, first of defunding the police and ultimately of, of abolishing the police, is now seriously being debated and academic papers are coming out. And I want to argue in this meeting, give you some ideas why we actually have as socialists to support this idea of abolition of the police. If you go around and ask people in the streets, um, what, do, what's, what are the police for? What will most people tell you in most situations, just walking down the shop to the shops or whatever? <laughs> to keep people safe. You know, to keep law and order and to keep people safe. That's the common perception of the police force. Probably anywhere in the world, except if you've been in some of these uh, confrontations that I've uh, uh, shown in these photographs. So the concept of the police as keeping the peace, as, you know, law and order, we're all very peaceful, and if it wasn't for the police, we'd, we'd sort of descend into a society of chaos. It's quite common. Of course, it's nonsense. For most of human society, pre-capitalist, pre-class society, there was no such thing as a police force. The modern police we have today is an invention of, of capitalism, as a matter of fact. And they, in the 1800s, they were created as a standing police force in this country. Why? Because of a rising working class, the industrialization of the country, the rising working class, and revolt in the working class, and the ruling class make a decision let's have a formal police force. Before it would be militias and people hired by private individuals to protect their property, etc. So we've had the, we haven't even had the police force for forever and ever. So it's not a continuous presence in society. So if you think that the police are there to keep people safe and prevent crime, on that measure alone, they fail. If you look at America, in the, I think it's the last 10, no, 40 years, the prison population has gone up 500%. 500%, for God's sake, 2 million people incarcerated in prisons in America today. And many of those people, disproportionately people of colour, 
people from poor backgrounds, people who have uh, educational needs, etc. And in that churn of criminality getting released, reoffending, going back, nothing changes. So they don't prevent crime either. They incarcerate, they don't prevent crime. And that is actually the same in this country. I'll come back to some of these figures later. And that's because the default setting of police forces is not to prevent crime, is not to take away the issues in society that may lead to what they define as criminal behaviour. It is actually to protect the ruling class from people, not to protect people. And I want, basically this talk is arguing because of that we need to get rid of them. Don't think, and maybe, I don't think anybody here might disagree with that. But the subtle, su some of the subtleties of the argument, um, whether the practicalities are possible, and let's talk about that later. But if you like this, this default setting of setting a police force up against the people, against the people, the them and us. Basically, um, in America, after the 1960s, that people might appreciate the revolt of the 1960s all over the world, the state moves to reassert control. And there's no, nowhere that did that more completely than in America. And the voting in of Richard Nixon, a right-wing Republican president, he ushers in this law and order agenda. Uh, it's always a war on something. They, 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 they formulate these policies, war on this. So it was war on crime. So immediately you're setting up a police force engaged in a war against the people. Uh, it morphed into war on drugs. Well, how is that going? So the American ruling class, very much, no idea, which there was a hint of previously, under Roosevelt and Johnson, that we're actually going to try and eradicate poverty, we're going to do something to alleviate poverty, um, and that, that's what we're having our war on, changes to war on crime, more funding for the police, more prisons built, more arming of the police, more categories of police. And with that, this mindset, this policy, top-down policy, that we are the last line between civilization and chaos. And in order to demonstrate how good they were at fighting crime, fighting again, they create categories of crime and they create categories of criminals, which they then target with force. The high, what's called the hyper-surveillance of sections of the population. And needless to say, in America, it's poor, could be poor white sections of the cities, but particularly poor black population of the cities. And you send in saturation policing. You also change the policy to create these petty crimes, which you then enforce with vigor. Traffic stops, loitering on a corner. Not only does this, is this petty harassment humiliate constantly, they actually find people. And one of the, one of the ironies of the Jackson, where uh, Michael Brown was shot, was that this militarised police force was actually financed by the petty fines imposed by the police on the very community they were attacking. So this constant churn of them and us, military against people, criminalisation of groups of people, incarcerations, fines, etc. That is the setting of the police that we are we have today in this country as well you know people might I hope people in the discussion will talk about it but that separation of the police as a force from the people the um, increased spending the militarization of the police and the targeting of communities and criminalizing them the examples are legion i mean i remember um the criminal justice act criminalized young people because it was response to the tories against rave culture they're terrified when young people get together. They were, they were, there, was, there was a special law put out for, so that the police could attack travellers. I remember this scenes of the police hiding in hedges, literally, in the countryside here, and leaping out to attack and arrest travellers, going about their peaceful, lawful business. So the targeting and the criminalisation of sections of the community goes on apace. So apart from you know, setting up this force to be against the people, the characteristics of police forces around the world 
are the same. I mean, I'm going to be talking mainly about America and um, this country, but some of the photographs I have here from, you know, all over the world, you can't tell which country you're in when you look at the police because they're all dressed the same. But there's three things I want to talk about as a giving force to this argument that we have to get rid of the police. And one is police and racism. I mean, where do you start? Where does it end? Every week recently, there's been a story of police officers finally getting investigated, finally getting disciplined, or not as the case may be, for blatant, horrific racism. I mean, you can talk about all the cases, the deaths at the hands of the police, either shot in the street, Mark Duggan, for example, or left to die on the cell floor in the jail while they're watching, or arresting people, sitting on them, as in the case of Shekhar Bio, in a little town in Scotland called Kirkcaldy, killing people with impunity. Disproportionately, people of colour. If you are Muslim, you'll get characterised as a terrorist. If you're black, you'll get terror characterised as a violent thug, irrational. This police profiling, racial profiling, it, 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 I mean, Kirkcaldy is a small town in Scotland. There are not many non-white faces in it. And yet the response of the police, I, d I don't know if you were at the rally yesterday when um, Gavar Anwar was speaking, he's the lawyer of the case, the public inquiry that's going on now. Uh, there's racism. <laughs> you don't have to be living in London or Birmingham for this racism to prevail in this weak police force in this country. And of course, the racism of the police in America. This is a quote from an investigation into the Chicago City Police, just in 2016. Just imagine this. The report concluded, there is no regard for the sanctity of life when it comes to people of colour. That's their own investigation into themselves. <coughs> for God's sake, that should have been disbanded right there and then, no argument. But it wasn't. Okay, so how many times do we have to hear? This is unacceptable. This is racism. Before something fundamentally is done. And the Black Lives Matter movement did inspire change to be argued for, particularly in America. So the defunding call, which you see on some of the placards and some of the demonstrations, there was a city, there's a city, and there's been an interesting um, study of what happened um, in this particular city, where they did try and defund. They didn't totally defund, they just diverted some funds away uh, as a means of addressing this, this issue. And they poured funds into training programs for the police. You know, implicit bias training, de-escalation techniques, uh, to address a, con a confrontation, um, and, and all stuff like that. Guess what, it didn't work. We're back to the same incidents of police brutality and police killings. However, you have to say there was an attempt to do something about it, but the fact that it didn't work for that particular police force shows that actually training the police is not the answer. One of the calls in the defund movement was to um, direct funds away from the police and into social programmes. So housing, education, employment, you know, going into schools, trauma centres to help people with mental health issues, which have been savagely cut, you know, all over the world, austerity, savagely cut. And again, nothing really happens, nothing really changes, even in these cities where there has been, if you like, some enlightened liberal mayor voted in and wants to make a name for themselves and tries to institute for some programmes. It all eventually unravels because of the unrelenting racism that is used as, as a tool of control by the police. And of course, we're in this country, um, the idea of institutional racism, apparently still controversial, uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, and Charles Hamilton, who were two civil rights activists in the 60s in America, first talked about institutional racism as being different from the individual racism of individuals. 
Right, so the, the petty humiliations, the serious humiliations, the constant harassment by individuals. But the institutions like the police, something called institutionalised racism, is something much more embedded, some, something much more part of the, the life and breath of that institution. That's difficult to often define, but it's very difficult to get rid of. It's more subtle, but nonetheless more as effective. And therefore, that is one of the things that you have to fight. And institutionalised racism is challenged as an idea. We know in, in this country, the Tories in, appointed people, placed people, to write reports, people like Tony Sewell, who came up with the idea that there's no such thing as institutionalised racism. No explanation for the racism of the police, except, oh, it's a few bad apples. And we heard this from Cressida Dick, the leader of the Met, leader of the Met, former leader of the Met Police, who even she presided over a disaster so great that they got rid of her eventually. By the way, six police forces in the UK are under special weather measures now. This is unprecedented. Special measures mean they have to get people from outside to tell them what they're doing wrong. Have they asked any of you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So, the racism of the police, all over the world, but, but if you look at the detail, it's, I mean, it's, beyond, it's beyond a joke. It's beyond something that people can ignore. The deaths in custody, the constant incidences of police racism not getting dealt with seriously. Something like 76 officers in the Met Police were disciplined for racism, only four dismissed in the last four years. That's ridiculous. You are seven times more likely to be stopped if you are black. You are five times more likely to be the subject of the use of force in this country if you're black. Sheffield died. Absolutely. And all the recent operational decisions of the police, stop and search, traffic stops, profiling of gangs, areas where gangs are, etc., are targeting areas where young black and white working class people live at a time of austerity. And this increases the hostility, increases the anger, in, which sometimes boils over into riots that people may want to talk about as well. So, you know, police and racism doesn't go away. Police and misogyny. My God. Sarah Everard. Not just that, murdered by a police officer. They attack a demonstration that was, well, it wasn't even a demonstration, it was a vigil in the memory of Sarah and other deaths of women, and they attack it. Well, somebody's made an operational decision to do that and arrest people. The famous image here, uh, well, we'll show it later. The former police chief, Suzanne Fish, describes a police chief who's a woman, describes a toxic culture of sexism and misogyny. Charing Cross Police Station in this city, the whole station, an investigation found disgraceful levels of misogyny, racism and sexual harassment in one unit. One unit. Unbelievable. If that was your workplace, what would happen to your workplace? If it was my school, we'd be shut down. But not the police. No, no. 2,702 officers accused of sexual misconduct in the last five years. Hardly any discipline. Ingrained attitudes to women demonstrated in a number of ways the way they treat domestic abuse cases, the way they ignore children who complain about sexual harassment and dismiss them because they're working class and they don't matter, they're ignorant, blah, blah. Look at any of the investigations of the last 50 years. The Yacht, you should watch the, do the documentary a young woman did on the Yorkshire Ripper case. Yeah. Unbelievable then, but it's true now as well, the way they investigate. They don't investigate. So, misogyny deeply ingrained in police forces. Their attitude to the working class. Now, looking around here, these pictures are up on the screen. The biggest single mobilisation of a police force in this country was to police the miners' strike. That's two pictures from the miners' strike in 1984. 
And if you were there, you know what I'm talking about. It might be ancient history to some people. But the lessons you learn about the role of the police and the state in that strike are very relevant for us today, and we need to learn those lessons. Okay? Miners went on strike in 1984. They knew this was coming. The Tories, Margaret Thatcher, picked a fight with them. She wanted to destroy the miners. She wanted to destroy the strongest section of the working class at the time, their union, the National Union of Mine Workers, and she wanted to shut down the mines. Might seem odd in these days of fossil fuels, but she did then. And there was a plan they put in place called the Ridley Plan. Again, if you are trade unionists entering into struggle, you want to read what the ruling class is capable of. The Ridley Plan was a plan before the strike. And part of that plan was to mobilise the police like an army against legally striking miners, their families and their communities. Miners went into that strike I actually quite like in the police. Lots of miners didn't live in cities, they lived in towns and villages. Okay? They saw local Bobby, they all knew each other. Right? And nothing opened their eyes to the nature of the police. Like when they went on strike and they faced the police on the other side of their picket lines. The police invaded villages, literally, it was like an army of occupation. They harassed men, women, children, families. They walked around at night shining torches in people's houses. They traipsed over gardens, I don't know. I'm actually from a mining village in Scotland and people took great pride in their gardens. You know, you can laugh, but they did. It was a hobby that miners could do. Flowers, vegetables, the police just trapped right through them. No, not a care. This is a picture, if you see on the right, that's, that's them in a village, chasing everyone, men, women, children. But the crucial point was, they turned up in thousands on the picket lines when miners were lawfully trying to stop scabs going. So who, who made the decision that the police became the instrument of the bosses of the coal board? The Tories did, because the police are an instrument of the ruling class. They used the benefit system against the miners, the army, spies, any underhand tactic they used. They created a new category of strike of, of, for benefit claimants of a striker where you weren't going to be entitled to benefits if you were a miner of the family. And the police were part of that system on a mass scale. There's a, there's a report just come out in Scotland. Um, they commit, the Scottish Parliament commissioned a report into the policing of the miners' strike in Scotland. I mean, how many years ago? Where's the justice when you have to wait this long for justice? As a result of the report, all the miners who were charged in, uh, during the strike have been pardoned. By the way, it's not the same as having your charges quashed. Does it consider the lives ruined because when you were charged, you got sacked. When you got sacked in the miners' strike, you got blacklisted. So in all these villages, what other work was there? None. So you were condemning families to poverty. No compensation for that. So while a pardon, miners are welcome in it, they're saying, what use is it to me now? And so of course some people haven't lived long enough to get it. But it's interesting, some of the quotes in the, in the even so long ago, um, one guy who was interviewed from a Scottish, a Scottish miner said, we thought we were pursuing an industrial dispute. They were waging class war. And <laughs> there's no way you, you learn that faster and quicker than on a picket line. So, you know, I encourage you to go along to a picket line, although the police didn't turn up the ones so far. So far. Another example, it's called the Steps Stop. Step, Steps is a wee town outside Glasgow. And when pickets were going to Hunterston Power Station to stop the coal getting in. So Hunterston is at the west. Lots of mines were on the east. So there was people driving by vans, buses, cars. Military operation by the police to stop the cars at Steps. They arrested 290 people for doing nothing, nothing illegal, Jail and charge him. 
but the effect was to stop people getting to the mass people. Okay? So when you understand that this is what the, fundamentally the role the police play in the state, you can understand why. So very, very quickly that strike became an us versus them, or as Thatcher called us, the enemy within. So, you know, how many more reasons you want to show that the police are not there to protect and to serve? Well, they do serve. They serve the ruling class against the working class, okay? And uh, it, it's interesting that in America, people are now talking about, and this is an American academic, Kianga Bamata Taylor. She had an article in The New Yorker, which I recommend you read if you're interested in this. And she's talking about the fact that defunding, quote, will not create a new society, but would shift the emphasis from control and coercion to community and provision. And she calls for a reimagining of a just society. Now, I think that's important because at a time when the Tories are ratcheting up authoritarian measures because they fear what's coming down the, right, down the road, revolt, strikes, etc., as all governments previous, Labour and Tory, by the way, they ratchet up the police powers and the authoritarianism. And therefore, you know, reimagining a just society is quite a radical call. Okay? It's quite a radical call. And Angela Davis, don't know if people know of Angela Davis, her autobiography is here, right? She was a Black Panther in the 60s, she was jailed, um, she was in solitary confinement for about 15 months. She was released, it was a cause celebre, and she's been a, she's a revolutionary socialist. She is still active, and one of her main themes of campaigning, well, so there are several, I have to say, Black, Black Lives Matter, women's rights, Palestinian rights, but she has been a campaigner for reform of the prison system for decades. And she talks about abolition. We have to abolish the police. They're useless at what they do, that's what I'm trying to point out. They don't solve crime. I mean, cranky, there was a, there was a report out recently that uh, less than 10% of report cases that are taken up by the police are solved. They can't, you know, forget all those cop shows that you show, that you watch, which, are, you know, might be quite entertaining and they solve crime. No, they don't. Most of, most of the crimes solve themselves. Yeah, or, or, or the public solve them. Or CCTV camera, please don't solve crime. And in fact, in the last few years, the, the number of cases that they, they've actually had that they have solved is damn, plunged. They don't solve crime. But what Angela Davis says is that she thinks that there should be an evolutionary change in the attitude to policing and to the criminal justice system. That the current, the current system doesn't work at any level, doesn't stop crime, doesn't make people feel safe, it doesn't, you know, when people engage in criminal behaviours, it doesn't change the conditions in which they are living, or it doesn't, you know, people re-offend in America, just churning out uh, newer and better criminals. And therefore, she described an evolutionary change, but she also talks about it's difficult to imagine this happening in the current capitalist society in which we live. She talks about she can only imagine this fundamental change with socialism. And Marxists have a reason, explanation for this that I've tried to highlight in different ways, and hopefully you can illuminate that a bit more. Karl Marx described the state as the committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. The state is not neutral. The state, the police, the judiciary, armed forces, prison, civil service have a monopoly of legitimate force and they are used by the ruling class, which is a minority, to continue their exploitation and oppression of the minority, majority, which is us. And that's why they need the police force. They are a minority. As Shelley, as Shelley said, we are many, they are few. But they have the police, they have the army, they have the spies and the rest. So Marx argued that 
because the state was not neutral and its institutions are there to organize the affairs of the ruling class, a working class movement cannot simply take over the institutions of the state and have more liberal or reformist approach to the state. It ultimately won't work. Now, that's not to say we don't support reforms. You know, anybody here fighting for justice, for, for um, reparations, for a change in the manner of policing in their area, you must be part of that fight. But what we're talking about is the big picture. You cannot reform the fundamental, na fundamental nature of the police away. Otherwise, I think we would have done it. And there's going to be no leadership on this from the Labour Party if you listen to Keir Starmer. Apart from the fact that he was director of public prosecutions, so basically he was prosecuting at the state, say, of the police, he was asked about defunding and he said it was nonsense. So don't look there for any support or answers, even though some of their elected mayors, uh, etc., are, are in charge of cities, people like Andy Burnham, Sadiq Khan. What difference have they made? I don't know, maybe you can tell me, but I don't see anything fundamentally different from the fact that they are mayors in these cities. What Lenin is, is the revolu Russian revolutionary Lenin, developed Marx's ideas in his book, The State and Revolution. And he said, the state must be smashed. And the point about the Russian Revolution is that the seeds of that imagining were there. Lenin witnessed it. That's why he wrote this book. That actually the working class in revolt can take down the state but replace it with something better. In control of the people, for the people. And when you imagine the possibilities that that opens up, as our, you know, activists have talked about, the reimagining, you can see in the workers' councils and, and things like that that are d democratically controlled and accountable to the people, you can imagine a society where there is no exploitation and no oppression and therefore the need of the police will wither away. We can abolish the police, absolutely but it's part of a state that will persist unless we bring that state down. And the way to do that is to combine those fights in a socialist revolution. Thank you for that, Charlotte. That was a brilliant meeting. So what we're going to do now is, is contributions. Um, I'll just quickly say this meeting is being filmed, so if you don't want to be on camera, please let us know. Um, so contributions, I'll, I'll call them. You'll have three minutes. I will time you, and I will be very strict. So stick to three minutes. Um, so yeah, so contributions, questions, whatever you like. Um, Oh, I just wanted, I read quite a few months ago that the police force in some countries is now trained by Israel, and um, which is obviously, you know, a very scary idea. But um, I, I wondered if a lot of the violence, it, it seems increased violence that we're seeing, like, uh, towards women on a, uh, you know, a, a vigil for Sarah Everard and things like that, are getting punched in the face. I actually saw on film one woman, get, a young woman, getting punched full in the face by a police officer and many other things as well. But um, I just wondered, do you think that has got anything to do with it or is it just this very severe right-wing government uh, influencing, or both maybe, you know? Perfect, thank you very much. Anyone else? Yep, we're sorry, blue. Yeah, West Coast. Sorry. Okay. Um, I've got. I've had a couple of personal negative experiences with police. When I was younger as a child, I used to play in a local park, and I got locked in. One of the park uh, people uh, tried to help me as well as some local residents, and there was a police van that went by and asked. I asked to help to get me over the fence. So I asked the police officer to come out. They said, "Do it yourself." So I was only, what, seven, eight years old. <laughs> Another experience was um, there was a, an incident where a rapist murdered a woman in Walthamstow in the Baker's Arms area, and we used to live in that area. And there was a couple of police officers who were knocking on doors. And someone, I know someone very close to me who was a victim of rape. Um, and 
they knocked on the door and my mum answered it and they said, can we come in? So they came in and they were talking about this <coughs> incident and all that. And they go, don't worry, don't worry, it's not a major situation. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> so you're telling me a rapist going about killing women, a person who raped happened to be my mother, and you're telling that to her face. I was, I mean, I was a little kid, but think, looking that back now, I'm just disgusted. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, if another of these scandals, when when there was a leak coming out of texts or cops texting each other, joking about rape mm -hmm. and homophobic and racist jokes to each other, saying the N word, uh, Gollywood was another one, hacky, all these things that were texting each other, like it was just general chat. Um, so. I'm, I'm not going to try and wrap up because I'm not going to keep. That's you got a minute. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to talk about these experience, experiences um, because it does still affect me to to this day and how they treated or what they said to my mum and how they, you know, tra treated me. And that was and those are only very mild instances. You know, I'm not uh, a young uh, a young black person, a young Asian person. I don't know what like to feel frisked and all that but I know they are twice as likely to get targeted and all that and an attack on one person is an attack on everybody so this is why more than ever we need mass unity to really get rid of the police perfect thank you so much you in the black yeah, I think, um, I mean, I agree with all the things, the case for getting rid of the police, police abolition, all the things that's been said. One of the arguments we're going to get is what do we replace them with? And I think we have to do with this argument. Because um, people, if someone's living on their own, say, the antisocial behaviour, or they feel threatened, or they've had the window smashed, blah, blah, blah. If they can't deal with it themselves, or they haven't, they don't know someone who could go and deal with it for them, or they haven't got the means, or don't wish to, to move out. People can end, end up going to the, that's just one example. Go, end up going to the police. They kind of all these criticisms of them, but they end up going to them because they feel there's nothing else. Sure, I mean we have to deal with the lack of youth centres, lack of youth workers, <coughs> community tenants associations, kind of kind of collect the collectiveness because um, like. We kind of force it into individual. You go, you go and retreat. Shut the door. At the end of the day, in your house, and there's not kind of sense of community. And I think, I mean, like, I think neoliberalism has made it worse. People, and people often, people commute so far to work and they don't live. They don't. They've not grown up where they live. Nothing wrong with that. But you don't know your neighbours. So you, people can get more paranoid about the neighbours and not trust them because they've never lived with them. They haven't gone to school with them. I'm not. That's not criticism. It's just it's easier to get paranoid. Can't trust my neighbours, can't trust anybody, oh dear, oh dear. People then never go to the police when something crops up because they don't know what else to do. So I think we need more of a discussion about what we say as an alternative. Plus, ideologically, they keep using the argument, well, I need a police to look after us, because if we didn't, it'd be like, you know, cowboy films and saloon bars where they beat each other up and then chuck someone over the banister and can have the OK corral because we're just the seething pit of barbarism, you see, without the police to just keep a, a lid on everything. I think. I like more discussion about the alternative to the police because we need it. We need to centralise. We need something. We need to answer this question. Thank you. In the red, the back. I was interested in uh, the beginning of your talk when you um, talked about the history of the police and uh, um, uh, prior to capitalism, uh, they were. Uh, Mercenaries did, did, did the same job. Uh, uh, thanks to my new friend next to me here, I know that the first London police force was established in 1830. I'm also aware that, um, like uh, Britain at least, to the best of my knowledge, was already considered like a, an agrarian capitalist economy by around the 1500s. So I was just wondering if you could expand anything on, if you know anything more about the history of the evolution of the police and what. <laughs> Thank you. In the red at the front. Okay, quickly, Sir Robert Peel set it up based on his experiences when he was running Ireland. Yeah. Um, 
and the special branch actually also came out of a unit in the force that he set up later in the century um, based on pursuing Irish terrorism when the Fenians were active um, in, in this country. So uh, that's just briefly on that. Because what I really wanted to, to take up was this question of how we envisage a society without the police and do we need something to replace it? And my answer to this would be, and I think it, part of this comes out really, really well in the book Abolition Feminism Now and some other stuff written by um, abolitionists, which is the connection between the prison industrial complex, uh, the role of the police, and the whole question of poverty and what creates the problems in the first place. And the police are actually policing a society in a racist and misogynist way in order to keep the lid on the problems which capitalism actually creates in terms of poverty, drugs, housing, mental health, and so on and so forth. And so I think that the concept that we really have what we need is the way in which the, uh, the, the getting rid of the police is part of a, of a process of getting rid of all those problems which create the issues in, in, in the first place. And the two things actually have to go hand in hand. We're talking about getting rid of capitalism and the only way we can get rid of cap capitalism if, is if we develop our collective strength as a working class movement and in the process of creating the thing that the other side of the coin of the policing of the, of the, of the communities during the mind strike in 84, 84, 84 to 85 was a solidarity in, uh, amongst minors, amongst minors' wives, but across society. It polarised society. And actually, if you think about you know, the gay liberation movement, who gave solidarity to the minors, the way in which uh, you know, that sense of solidarity, I haven't experienced that very often in my life about that sense of we're all in it together and you share together, you're part and parcel of the same struggle and, and therefore you, you actually look at one another different, differently. You feel part and parts, you trust people in a different kind of way because you're on the same side, a part of that same struggle. And I think imagining that, we actually have to have this imagination that collective struggle gives us a different sense of ourselves and, and there's a different sense of safety seconds. and therefore of the beginnings of a different way of addressing when we do bad things to one another um, and that amongst ourselves collectively we can find the ways of addressing why somebody maybe wanted to hit somebody or treat somebody badly and therefore we wouldn't need a police force, we would need collective organisation which we would create according to what fitted best in terms of dealing with these issues. I don't know whether that makes sense, but anyway. Uh, yeah, so it's just a similar comment to what somebody made over there. If it's just the quick question I wanted to pose was specifically how would you deal with like violent crime if you're going to uh, abolish it? So I understand the argument that you know, in a social society, we have, you know, a society based around people's, people's needs, and then we're going to have less poverty, people are going to be much better, you know, less mental illness. I don't think you can assume that all violence is going to, is going to disappear. So uh, in those cases that remain, what are you going to do? Um, uh, and if you have uh, an agency that deals with people by force, isn't that really kind of just like the police? And the, I know like in Zinalicus, Spain, the police were gone, but they had people's militias, which still arrested people and put people into, into prison. Um, so I was just wondering, is the boundary between reforming the police, having the police force pared back and under popular control, is there, is, there, is there a distinction between that and abolishing the police? Thank you. Green at the back. Oh, just to build on a few points made, um, abolish the police, just that question had a, abolish the police means abolish the police. Mm -hmm. Like just get rid of them, yeah. but we know that's a process and that takes time. And abolition doesn't say we're not going to continue harming and being violent towards each other. Abolition is a question and like that person asks, how do we deal with that? Ruth Wilson Gilmore speaks about the current system we have is one built on organized abandonment where we disappear people, we put people in prisons and think that solves the problem. But we know that prisons themselves are sites of sexual and physical violence as well. So what Ruth Wilson, Wilson Gilmore speaks about is radical dependency. When we do an act harm interpersonally between each other, how do we navigate that in community, in relation with each other? 
there was talk about imagination. I'd really work to recommend the work of Lola Holofemi, who sp speaks about experiments imagining otherwise, and she talks about how to navigate like sexual violence, harm like that, within the community. And just one last point, Ruth Wilson Gilmore also speaks about if we're talking about abolition, abolition means changing everything. It's not just the prison industrial complex, it's thinking about borders and borderization, boosting legal and illegal, all these processes are interconnected and how that ties into reimagining the world. It's a difficult process, it's really hard to get there, but we can do it if we do it together. And that's how harm reduction and navigating together will look like. Charlotte, I thought, um, well you reminded me how much I hate the police and I don't need a lot of reminding, but I thought what you drew out is it isn't just about the individuals in the police force, which is often how it's characterised, these bad few individuals, it's the role they play as a whole institution in society, that they are there to uphold and just, you know, defend capitalism, a system of a tiny minority owning everything based on brutal exploitation, division, oppression, and as such, as a whole institution, all those inequalities of capitalism are completely entrenched with them. That's why they're worse. They're more racist, more sexist, more homophobic than you get in any other workforce because they're defending a system of which those things come out of. And you think about the individuals. Cressida Dick, who was head of Metropolitan Police, she's a woman. She's gay, actually. But she actually oversaw <coughs> the killing of John Charles de Menzies. She oversaw actually what happened with Sarah Everard. It's not about having individuals at the top. It's about what role that institution plays in society. And I think what we're arguing here is that actually, therefore, we want to get rid of capitalism completely. We want to get rid of a class society where actually minority at the top have to enforce their rule through the state. I mean, Lenin the Revolutionary called these uh, things the special bodies of armed men. That's what they are, because they're a tiny minority have to use them to keep the rest of us in line. So we're talking about complete transformation and having a different sort of society where you don't have that at the top, where people are running it directly um, themselves. And I think in that, actually, let's be honest about the police. Number one, they cause a lot of violence, let's be honest. You know, it's not like they help, help violent crime. They kill people, black people. You know, what they did at the vigil. So that's number one. Number two, they don't actually deal with a lot of it. They've effectively decriminalised rape because they don't take it seriously and don't take it through. So they don't actually do any of these things that they say. But also, actually, a lot of the crimes in capitalism, so-called, are crimes because of the system we live in, of poverty, of how people are forced to live. In a different world, where actually, you know, people had control, there was plenty for everybody, actually, there may be disagreements, but you don't need an external armed force. People can sort that out between themselves in that way. And that's why for us as revolutionary socialists, we are for completely abolishing the police, and that is part of a revolutionary transformation of society, where actually we will live in a completely different way and won't need an external force of rulers forcing it down. We will run it ourselves. Yeah. Right, so um, I completely agree with whatever, whatever has been said in the, at this, uh, this discussion. I myself have never felt uh, comfortable with the police. I have family who suffer from mental health issues, and whatever, no matter how bad the crisis is, uh, I have never, uh, I have never felt comfortable calling the police. I have always called, called them paramedics. But uh, I do believe that there needs to be an alternative if we abolish the, the police, because uh, if we if we look at if we do succeed in, in, a, in a revolution, uh, then we would largely be uh, surrounded by capitalist, imperialist uh, nations who, 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 would, who would influence a counter-revolution, as we have seen in most socialist revolutions that have, uh, that have, uh, attempted, that have been attempted in the Middle East and Latin America, especially in El Salvador when the United States themselves have completely massacred the Revolution, and uh, and as we've seen in in Paris in the Paris Commune, where uh, Western imperialist um, militias have uh, have completely uh, destroyed the revolution. Well, there there has to be there has to be uh, some sort of force that that uh, that fights uh, the, the, uh, this influence, and no matter no no and. Even without the uh, Western in, in, influence, there would there would be counter revolutionaries, and and they themselves would be much more influenced by 
the Western revolution, Western imperialism, like, like the United States. And I, I do believe that there has to be uh, some sort of alternative for to enforce the, the revolution. Thank you. Uh, probably about two more. So in the white, then. He's his hand up a lot longer. Than oh, him. sorry. Did, did you get your hat? I didn't even see it. Well, it's been, he's been up there all the time. <laughs> no way. Don't worry about it. It's my um, bad. Charlotte was very good about s describing how actually useless the police are in solving crime. I live in France, where we have a specific group of armed police, the CRS, who are used by the state to basically intervene in any problem the French state has. They've criminalised Muslim youth, so the CRS are used in the suburbs of Paris and Marseille to keep the lid on these kids, to make sure that they stay where they are, they don't do anything. If they do, they are killed. They're, they're also used in the Gilets Jaunes um, movement, where, which was basically a movement to complain about the cost of living, that actually people could not survive on the wages they were getting. Who did the French state use? They use the CRS to, to confront and attack these groups of people. People were blinded with rubber bullets. Mm -hmm. This is nothing to do with solving crime. It's a specific group of armed police um, to make sure that there is no, um, no, no actually proof of people trying to get a better life. Because if they do, it's against, it's against the state. And the state is so worried that they have this group of people. These people, the CRS, are recruited. They never serve in their own region. So they have no link with the people in their region. It's very specific, a way that the, the, the state uses its power to criminalize and stop people revolting. I just, I just think it was great. So, uh, and you know, the imagery of like and what you described in terms of the miners and the you know attacks upon industrial -based workers. I'm just thinking about the child Q situation. And if you I'm a school teacher, so you think about what we do. A lot of what we do is a form of social control. And yeah, this is the ruling class ruling by consent. And how desperate it has actually got. But it cannot rule by consent through the education system. It's actually had to use in the areas of the if you like, ruled by consent, it now has to use force and coercion. That violence, because it is violence, that was shown to that young uh, child, is an absolute desperate situation, I think, as much for us as it is for capitalism as well. That you can't run an education system through consent, you have to use coercion and force to reinforce your values, your ideology, and I think the response to that has been a brilliant response from our side, which is to say this is absolutely horrific. What we want is a proper education system, because I think that does open up the alternatives actually to, to the police as well. Because this is a sign, actually, how do you, how, you know, how do you best deal with behaviour? Because this is also about behaviour in schools, isn't it? How do you best deal with behaviour in schools? You deal with it by a much better curriculum, a reduced workload, less pressure upon teachers, etc., etc. All the kind of performance-related pay crap that we have to go through and all the rest of it. That builds and bonds the relationships with our students, our communities, and all the rest of it, right? And then we can actually have a consent and a mutual consent with our, with our students and with our communities as well. That is the best way, because then it actually starts to challenge do we really need police in school? If we don't need them in the areas of consent, we don't need them there either. And I think that's really what we should be pushing for. All right, I think we're going to leave it at that. That was a great last contribution, great contributions from everyone as well. So I apologise if I didn't call you. You can play to me later if you like. Um, from there, what I'm going to do is quickly uh, pass it back to Charlotte, who will just sum up, come back to some of your many questions and uh, see what you can yeah. do. Thanks for coming here. I know we were up some big competition, but it's a fantastic discussion, so thanks for that. And plenty to think about, I think. I, I mean, what, what this comrade said about teaching I think we have a campaign of getting cops out of school. Yeah. I mean for God's sake what the, I mean, sometimes you find yourself in a school and 
you know, you hear about something in the community, and schools do still, you know, they're parts of the community. And um, then they, they, there's a highlight for something that happened, some incident. And you find yourself the only person in the school saying, no, I don't think we should have a place in the school. And then the next thing, you know, it's a nice little community copper. And I remember an assembly where, I didn't know it, but the, one of the cops was coming in and telling to the children that they were going to have a, a test of a pilot scheme of, which basically was stop and search. I mean, this is Knightswood in Glasgow, where they were going to have a zone because there had been fights along the canal. Gangs were turning up and fighting. And um, they were going to have this sort of exclusion zone where they were going to have police and they were going to stop and search kids. I remember him saying, if we search your bag and there's a comb in it, we can say that that's a weapon. This is to a group of 11 and 12 year olds. That's how the process works. You know, and the kids get to think, oh my God, we've got to rely on the police for our own safety. And I should think, oh, no, let's not go out. It's my fault if I'm there. That's how the thought process starts. I think we should have a campaign, get the police out of schools. Just thought of that one there, but it's a goer. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> But it's interesting that the, 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 the discussion is really two things. One, crime, what is crime? And the other is the police himself. And I think the, the former one I didn't spend so much time on. But what is crime? You know, the police and the state define crime. That's one of the roles of the state is to say, this is a law, you're against the law. And they make up these things all the time. So now... 10 years you could get for sitting in the road on an extinction rebellion protest. Why? Because they're fighting the protest. So the whole history, you know, pre-capitalism, class society, actually pre-class society, so before written history, as far as we know, there was no group of people that could be described in any way as police or a certain control. Why? The right wing would have us believe that human behaviour, this is, this is human behaviour, we're violent, we're competitive, we want to get one over on somebody else, because that's capitalism. But that isn't how human beings are. And then for the most of human history, human beings cooperated on this planet, because if they didn't, they'd have died out. You know, so we are living in a class society, a capitalist society, which is driven by profit and competition. Competition between companies, competition between countries and states and blocks, and we're certainly in the middle of this, and therefore competition between individuals. And this is part of the, how capitalism, actually, yes, through the school system as well, the media, everything, tells people you need to be controlled. We need police. And what, what does Labour come along when there is an issue with the police? We need more police! I said, that's the answer to it. No, we don't need more police. The reimagining is you actually take human beings as real people, as people that matter, that actually care about each other. One of the things in COVID was what the comrade up there was talking about, the isolation of people. It did actually bring communities together. If you hadn't spoken to your neighbour, you were out there clapping maybe, and you actually met people. And there were little WhatsApp groups set up. You know, if you need a t somebody to talk to, come and help. You know, there's walking groups if you want to come out and you, you, you feel isolated, let's meet and do a walk around the area. But that in it, I mean, it's, it's a relatively small example, but that's how people could organise. You don't actually need the police. It is the capitalist society that drives people to crime. The alienation, the lack of control over your own situation. The, the, you know, think about what families are having to put up with after COVID, maybe bereavement. You can't get a doctor, you can't get a dentist, you can't go on holiday for God's sake. Capitalism can't arrange the basic things for people and people feel the strain of it. And then they get, they, they sometimes lash out at people up, the powerless next to them. That's what capitalism creates. It's not human nature to behave like that. And it's a leap of the imagination, I know. I mean, you know, you look at some of these science fiction about the future, and they're all based on this idea that human beings are naturally aggressive and competitive. Let's have some science fiction that says people actually can get on in communities and organise their communities for the best for themselves. So it's difficult. It is difficult to say it's possible, but it, it can only be possible if we have enough people fighting for it. And those sorts of reforms, you know, get the police out 
I know we can make fun of neighbourhood watch schemes, you know, and all the rest of it, but some sort of community in which people value each other, that, that, that's how we want to live our lives, isn't it? But most of the time, I mean, we've talked about the police a lot as an instrument of class rule, class force. Most of the time, people live their lives without that in their lives. You know, you get on with it. You know, you, may, you might look at the hotel and say, oh my God, what have they done now? And then you go to work and come back. You might never see a police officer. So it's possible to do without the police. But they are an instrument of class rule, and that's why we're going to be seeing and hearing more of the police and the cr criminal rights, or lack of criminal rights. And one of the, the glamorisation of the police and crime fighting in all these series and films that go on, I tell you, one of the... Oh, God, it was, it was tragic to watch. It was a series that was about the forensic and police working together in Birmingham. And it was a series of murder cases. And where people died. And... It was the most pathetic of circumstances in which people died. It was, it was people with nothing, powerless people lashing out. There was one story where there was this group running, running, you know, growing a few cannabis plants in a house. I mean, for fuck's sake. And the police... And then another group came in and stole two cannabis plants. And there was a fight and two people died. That's what happens in society. Please don't stop that. Creating the criminalisation of drugs created that. And then you get the police to follow it up. A tragic waste of life of two young people. And that was all the stories of the, of the, of the murders that this highlighted. Not glamorous, not, not even fucking subtle. Just a response to the condition they were in. So if you build a society that's different, people will not behave like that. You have to have some faith in human, human society or else what's the point of changing it? We're going to be stuck in this cycle of class rule and destruction and war and tension, war on this, war on that, forever. There has to be a way to break that. And as far as I can see, as a Marxist, Marx give us, gives us the tools to do it. We learn from history. We learn the mistakes of history, but we don't repeat them, please. We have to unite in a fight on all fronts. Now we're going to need it more than ever. That sort of unity and solidarity that, you know, Sheila talked about, we experienced it in the minor strike. We can experience that again. And when you know the power of people when they work together, you can reimagine. You can know that something is different is possible when you take away the horrors of capitalist society. But for that, folks, you need a revolution and you need a revolutionary party. So if you're not a member of the SWP, please consider joining. Thank you.